This is CBC Here and Now. I'm on board the new MV Legionnaire as it officially began serving the Belle Island Ferry Run. Still has that new car smell. Or maybe it's the scent of that $50 million price tag. Well, you can see a gorgeous evening out there right now and some nice weather in the forecast this week. So far, Regatta Day is looking good. I'll break down all the details coming up. Well, good evening and let's get straight to our top story and a surprise resignation in the provincial government. She was one of the key cabinet members, but tonight, Kathy Bennett is out as finance minister. And of course, a personal situation that she, uh, she's dealing with, and so this is a personal decision for hers. Bennett was a key member of the Premier's Cabinet, delivering two controversial well, budgets. Tonight, she's not doing interviews, but she says she's leaving because of multiple personal issues. She's complained of online harassment over the decisions she's made, but she's not leaving politics. She's staying on as the MHA for Windsor Lake. So, with Bennett out, who's in? Well, former Speaker Tom Osborne is now the new Finance Minister. Here now's Megan McCabe has been following this story. Megan, what does Bennett's resignation mean for the government? Well, she's walking away from this critical portfolio at a critical time, negotiating with the province's public sector unions and budgeting in dire financial conditions. The Premier says Osborne's experience is key. He's someone that, you know, I've relied on in the past for sure. And I think Tom's ready for this. And it's really about the experience. Uh, Tom's a great relationship builder. And, you know, he will build on the work that, you know, Minister Bennett has already done. And, uh, you know, he takes on a very significant role at a very important time in the history of our province. Great relationship builder is an important phrase there. Collective bargaining with the unions has not been going well under Kathy Bennett. Earlier this year, NAEP accused her of showing contempt for the process, and the government called in a conciliator, a rare move, to help with negotiations, saying they simply were not moving. Osborne's well-liked, been an MHA for over 20 years, and a Tory cabinet minister before he left that party. I intend to, within the next 48 hours, read out, reach out to the, uh, the leadership of the unions and, and start discussions. Um, you know, I, I want to move forward and, and see these negotiations move forward. Uh, I intend to work in, in good faith with the leadership of the unions. Opposition leader Paul Davis says Bennett's departure and today's changes show signs of dissent within the party. It's not difficult to see, and when you see a uh, cabinet minister right after a cabinet retreat, summer cabinet retreat, uh, to uh, resign from cabinet to jump ship uh, when she was one of their key captains of industry, I think is, is, uh, is telling as well. It may be too early to tell if Bennett quitting cabinet is a sign of problems within the Liberal Party or not, or if these changes will help. A poll last week shows that people think the economy is getting worse and support the PCs more than the Liberals. Peter? Thanks. That's the CBC's Megan McCabe reporting for us tonight. And coming up in about 23 minutes from now, Premier Ball will weigh in on today's resignations. But those weren't the only changes. Here's who else is in and out of cabinet. Let's start first with a newcomer, Lisa Dempster. She becomes the new Minister of Children, Seniors and Social Development. Jerry Byrne is now the Fisheries Minister. Al Hawkins takes over for Byrne in his old portfolio of Advanced Education and Skills. And that leaves Transportation and Works free for Steve Crocker, who moves out of Fisheries. Sherry Gambin-Walsh is now going to be the Minister of Service and Al. She takes over for Perry Trimper. And... Why is she taking over for Trimper? Well, he's out of cabinet. Instead, he's going to run for the job of Speaker of the House of Assembly, and he does have the backing of the Premier. It's not all politics tonight on Here and Now. We also have these stories coming up for you. She was my life, and now like, I feel like this is what I've got left for her. Performing through the pain, a Bonavista teen finds a special way to pay tribute to her sister. Hydro wants to hike power rates, but a consumer advocate says the application doesn't add up. And we'll take you to a special summer camp for kids with type 1 diabetes. Well, Marystown Mayor Sam Sinyard has been charged with using a forged document, an affidavit. RCMP say the 57-year-old was briefly arrested on July 8th. According to information filed in provincial court, the allegations of forgery happened sometime between January 2015 and January 2016. 
Senior told CBC he expects to be fully exonerated. He has a court date set for late next month in Grand Bank. Well, they call themselves the Labrador Three. Ten days ago, Marjorie Flowers, Jim Learning and Eldred Davis were all sent to Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's. The protesters refused to agree to a court order not to block the entrances to the Muskrat Falls site. Well, today they're out of jail. Jacob Barker has more on that story. Getting into Supreme Court in Happy Valley Goose Bay was a bit different today. Extra sheriff's officers and a metal detector were brought in. It's a security measure that sheriff's office take. The 40-odd people were here to see the trio some have dubbed the Labrador Three, Jim Learning, Marjorie Flowers and Eldred Davis. They spent the better part of the last 10 days behind bars. Davis says he refused to eat, though he wouldn't call it a hunger strike. In the back of my mind, one possibility was that if they wanted to keep me out there longer, they might have to deal with a dead person. Supporters brought him smoked fish to break his fast. Davis agreed to sign an undertaking that will keep him away from the site except at a spot directly across from the entrance. I guess the fact that I, I bailed out, I gave up, it, it didn't, uh, didn't go well. <laughs> well, I guess I didn't really give up, but I, I, I had to kind of transfer my uh, abilities and uh, I guess my contribution in another direction. Marjorie Flowers also walked out of the courthouse today, not exactly a free woman. Her lawyer asked for house arrest. Nalcor's lawyer and the judge agreed. I did feel very uh, oppressed, very oppressed. And I, 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 that has lifted a bit now that I have this new order. She also responded to Justice Minister Andrew Parsons, who said he won't interfere with the court process after Canadian senators called for the protesters' release. And he has every bit of power to make a difference. Every bit of power. He's choosing not to. And Jim Learning, who earlier in the day said there was no choice but for him to be in prison, later opted for house arrest as well. He wants to challenge the court's injunction. It would be good, but we simply can't afford it. That would be the ideal thing, to have that taken away. All three are set to be back in court at the end of August to argue their cases. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, the long wait is over for residents of Belle Island. A new and spacious ferry called the MV Legionnaire officially went into service on the tickle between Portugal Cove and Belle Island today. And it's being hailed by many as an island game changer. Well, the CBC's Terry Roberts is on board the ferry tonight. He was at the special ceremony this morning. Terry? Uh, yes, Peter. Well, it's uh, 17 months later than originally scheduled testing the patience of everyone who depend on this service. Well, now the Legionnaire is in business. We're actually leaving the dock right now here in Portugal Cove on our way to Belle Island. She's bigger, modern, and generating plenty of confidence on an island that sure could use some good news. Dozens came aboard the Legionnaire this morning for a commencement ceremony, sizing up the larger vessel capacity, impressive lounges, and other amenities, music, prayers, Food. Despite the negativity of past months, everyone seemed to be in an upbeat mood today, including Wabana Mayor Gary Gazine, who's celebrating his 60th birthday. Today is a day I never ever thought I'd live to see. I'm emotional because this here today is Bell Island's reality. I'm glad to say that, you know, there's no doubt that uh, this is going to pay off. And there's no better man, happier man, to see this here today. As everyone said, what did you get for your birthday? I said, I got a new boat. They said, a pleasure craft. I said, no, a big boat to take all the people back and forth. Actually, I believe within six months, you'll start to see property values increase. You will see more new homes being built. Uh, businesses may uh, very well establish here, uh, seeing as how our population will be starting to grow now. Once you make this service reliable, and accessible to everyone on Bell Island, then yes, this is gonna be a very positive step for Bell Island. Uh, now this all doesn't come cheap. The Legionnaire comes with a price tag of, get this, $50 million. And the wharf upgrades necessary for it to operate, well, originally pegged at seven million, now 12 million. But the people, uh, this is really the busiest intra-provincial ferry service in the province. 
and the people on Bell Island say this upgrade is long overdue. So one of the big questions now, considering all the problems they have with the sister ship, the veteran on the Fogo Island run, is will this be a reliable service? Well, we'll have more on that part of the story coming up on Here and Now. I'm Terry Roberts reporting live from the MV Legionnaire on Conception Bay. Coming up in just a few minutes, we'll take you to a summer camp for kids with type 1 diabetes. Ryan's off this week, so mm -hmm. Carolyn is here uh, taking care of the weather. Yes. And I gotta say, the weekend, bit of a mixed bag. It really was. Saturday, of course, was gorgeous. But oh, yeah. then we got all the rain, which is great for the garden. Oh, yeah, you're, I'm sure your garden was I very happy it. yesterday. <laughs> yeah, it was good feeding. So, uh, yes, yeah, a bit of rain is, is great. So, and of course, Saturday night was beautiful for all of the different uh, festivals on the go and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. The Lantern Festival was one of the big ones. Weather worked out well for them. Let's take a look. Well, yeah, beautiful sight there. This was uh, some of the pictures wow. from the Lantern Festival. They, ooh, complete with a Confederation building there, you can see. It's the 17th annual festival. Wow, and that was held, of course, in uh, Victoria Park on Saturday night. Wow, that's, that's a lot of light. Yeah, 17th annual festival, and uh, last year they didn't have it because of construction in the park, so nice to see it back. Right. Lovely. All right, well, let's... Uh 
see how the weather is looking. This is a little summary of uh, what's to come. Some sun and cloud tomorrow uh, in the east. It'll look very similar to today. A few showers coming in the evening and uh, for the west and central and parts of Labrador, some showers coming tomorrow afternoon. And so far, so good for the regatta day. I'll get into those details. It's not going to be a scorcher by any stretch, but uh, it's looking pretty decent. So this is how we're looking uh, overnight tonight. Not a whole lot happening on the island. You can see the showers that will be coming through across Labrador this evening, bringing with it uh, the potential for some thunder showers in western Labrador. So starting off the day, lots of showers uh, in Labrador. Temperatures pretty cool starting off the day in the single digits along the coastline there uh, on the island in the west. Fairly cool start to the day as well, but uh, Fairly clear overnight tonight, 11 degrees uh, tomorrow morning to start the day as well in the east. Looking ahead to Tuesday, we have those showers that will be moving across the island here and lingering up in Labrador. So the west coast and central will receive the bulk of that, about five millimeters expected there. And once again, there is a chance for some thunder showers there. But in the east, it's going to be another lovely day. We're going to start at about 12 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud and winds are fairly light. For from the east 15 and uh, it'll heat up to about 17 by two o'clock but a high tomorrow of about 20 and things will start to cool down in the evening and some showers will move in for the eve of the regatta so if you're heading out on tuesday night then uh, potential for some showers there so this is the forecast for tomorrow on the Avalon Peninsula, things are looking lovely. Temperatures hovering around the 20 degree mark with some sun and cloud as well uh, in Marystown, 22 degrees with uh, a mix of sun and cloud. So the wet weather here in central parts of the island and potential for thunder showers tomorrow in Grand Falls, Windsor, Bay Vert. Temperatures a little bit cooler than you've been used to, 16 degrees as the high there and about five millimeters of rain expected there as well as on uh, the west coast. Cornerbrook looking at showers uh, throughout the day. This will be uh, later in the afternoon and uh, potential for some thunder showers in Humber Valley and 16 as the high there and more wet weather as we head north. So Cartwright's looking at about 15 degrees as the high tomorrow mix of uh, some sun and some showers in the Straits 13 as the high there. For the rest of Labrador, of course, it will remain fairly cool along the coastline, a very drizzly day, but things will start to clear off. That drizzle and shower should mostly be in the morning, and by the time the afternoon comes, things should start looking up, and 18 degrees as the high in Lab City Wabush tomorrow. So I just wanted to look ahead a little bit to, to Wednesday, so this is kind of a tighter look on the island. Uh, Tuesday night, we have those showers that uh, will be coming in, but you can see that Wednesday regatta day 5 a.m. We're looking at a lot of cloud cover here and the potential for maybe some small patchy showers, but so far not a lot of precipitation on the go and so far winds are looking pretty good. Of course, we will have a much better picture of how all of that is going to break down tomorrow and a little bit later in the show. I'll have your long range forecast. Thanks, Carolyn. Certainly one thing that's always a bit weather dependent is summer camp, and it's a time for kids with things in common to come together and have fun. Well, today was the first day for Camp Do You Wanna, where kids who all have type 1 diabetes come together. Here now is Nakshit Pandit has more. It was a packed first day for the kids at Camp Do Wanna. We've been doing lots of fun things, and we started out early in the morning with breakfast, and... Now it's after lunch and we have electives after lunch. But outdoors fun was not the only thing on the mind of organizers. This year, like every year, the kids at the camp, organized by Diabetes Canada, will indulge in their sense of adventure in a safe environment. Medical staff will be around at all times to see campers manage their diabetes independently. So basically we're monitoring the children, monitoring for their uh, blood glucose levels. So we're testing them four to five times a day on a regular basis and also when they're needed. So if they go low, we're treating them at low stations. So we're, as medical staff, we are positioned all over the camp. In an environment specifically for kids with type 1 diabetes, for many of them means they get to break out of their shell. We all do the same thing, like... Like before, say, lunch, we all have to check our sugars. 
and it's not just one person doing it and mm. it's like makes you feel like different. Camp counselors say the process is also about coaching the children on how to deal with the stigma of having the condition. It's definitely difficult. You're definitely alienated in a very intricate sort of way. Uh, so like, yeah, you're dealing with an illness that's very, very rigid in what you have to do. You said taking needles, you said changing your sights, what you can and cannot eat is all very important. You said living as a child, especially in a rural community, it's hard to keep on track and keep yourself within those guidelines. Among other things, camp activities on the agenda include archery, arts, crafts, photography, swimming and other sports. The camp runs until Friday and these kids here will learn some important life skills over the coming week. But their focus right now seems to be on just having a good time. Nakshi Pandit, CBC News, Lavrock Camp. George Street Festival is still in full swing, at least until Wednesday. And what better way to rebound from a night of live music and merriment than with an early morning stretch? Yeah, it was a very different scene on Saturday morning when the downtown street turned into a yoga studio. Nearly 800 people packed onto George Street, where just a few hours before there were a hundred of, sorry, several hundred of them dancing and drinking the night away. Organizers were skeptical when they were first approached about the idea, but say the space could be used for any number of daytime activities. Well, big news for Bell Island commuters. Coming up, we're going to be back live on board the MV Legionnaire for its first day on the Tickle.
Welcome back to Here Now, and we want to take you back to Conception Bay, where the MV Legionnaire is officially in service between Portugal Cove and Belle Island. There's plenty of hype today at the ceremony to introduce the new vessel. This after some criticisms and questions about the $100 million purchase of the Legionnaire and her sister ship, the MV Veteran, which is servicing Fogo. Well, Terry Roberts joins us live again from on board the ferry, which is in service right now. Terry, how's it running? Well, uh, very pleasurable cruise across the Tickle uh, just now. The Legionnaire is running like a top. Uh, well, will it stay that way? That's the big question, considering uh, a lot of the uh, shocking uh, incidents that have come up. Uh, shocking, the word used by uh, uh, Transportation Minister Al Hawkins. At least he was the Transportation Minister until just a few hours ago. So I asked him earlier this morning during this ceremony uh, to begin to commence this service, whether or not he's confident that this service will be reliable. He was cautiously optimistic. We've been working hard uh, to ensure that we do have these vessels are reliable and will provide a reliable service uh, to the folk uh, on Bell Island. And so again, it's uh, one day at a time and uh, we're looking forward uh, to this vessel providing the service uh, that the investment uh, warrants uh, from, from uh, such an investment. Now there's a uh, good reason to be cautious because we all know by now the, the problems that plagued the veteran, the Legionnaire sister ship, when she went into service on the Fogo Island uh, ferry service. Now the, the company that built these ships, Adamen, built them in Romania, they extended the warranty on the veteran at the time. Now one of the questions today, Hawkins, uh, you know, he said those issues that plagued the veteran were also investigated and addressed on this ship, the Legionnaire. Now, the problem with the uh, uh, ramp that, was, uh, that was occurred on the Legionnaire just a week or so ago, that's been fixed. And meanwhile, everyone here are crossing their fingers that the service will be reliable, safe, and efficient. This ferry will be a game changer. It'll uh, open up economic development. It'll open up a, another opportunity for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to promote tourism. It'll open up an opportunity for people to get uh, more access to health care and education. And for the commuting public, who commute every day to work in places like St. John's and Mount Pearl and CBS, an opportunity to have a reliable ferry service that gets them to and from without uh, spending five and six extra hours to work eight hours a day. Now, as you can see, uh, passengers and vehicles are starting to disembark right now from the Legionnaire, but people I spoke with today say the service on the Tickle was the worst it's been in recent memory in the last 18 months or so. Of course, we know there was uh, major wharf upgrades on both sides of the Tickle, and oftentimes there was uh, only one vessel on the service. Now that made for uh, very difficult circumstances for many of the 400 or so people here on Bell Island who commute to works every day in the St. John's area. Now they're hoping that's all behind them. Uh, Reporting live on board the MV Legionnaire right here on Bell Island. I'm Terry Roberts for Here and Now. Well, returning now to our top story, the resignation of Finance Minister Kathy Bennett. She wasn't speaking today, but Premier Dwight Ball was. He praised her work as Finance Minister, and he said more about why exactly she stepped down. Kathy Bennett has the minister responsible for you know, the finances of this province has worked tirelessly over the last you know, 20 months or so. And it's been really a monumental task that uh, within her department to get us where we are today in a very stable situation for the province. Uh, I guess you could just look back and reflect in recent days, the responses from the bond rating agencies as an example, of the kind of discipline that it takes to lead that portfolio. And we certainly wish Kathy all the best in, in the future. I know she will do an excellent job representing the people of Windsor Lake and she will be there as part of our caucus and still contributing in the way that Kathy does. And so really I uh, want to say thanks to Kathy for the work that she's done. We're very proud and pleased with the accomplishments that she's made. During those two discussions that you had with her, did she at all uh, express any unhappiness with serving in cabinet or with the direction of government or your leadership? No, no. This is you know this is strictly around you know personal uh, personal reasons for Minister Bennett, and uh, you know she's one of the earliest chats that I had this morning as well, and she'll continue to be uh, supportive and you know work in the transition. But these are for personal reasons for a minister, and you know when you look at individuals, no matter who we are in government, uh, in my capacity as premier, when we have those types of discussions, we had to support, uh, you know, uh, 
a member, and we have to support individuals who find themselves in those situations. So it's, it's really about you know, making sure that all of us as individuals, you know, we make sure that we're in uh, our personal situations are, are really good, and that's where we need to be to be productive. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro wants to raise rates by 13% over the next two years. Next, I'll speak with the consumer advocate Dennis Brown about why he's skeptical about their request. Welcome back to Here and Now. Oil furnaces, wood stoves and heat pumps. That's where the consumer advocate says people are going to turn if electricity rates keep going up. Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro has announced plans to push for a 13% hike to electricity rates. Hydro says the increase is necessary to cover the cost of improving the system and prevent widespread outages like we saw back in Dark NL. Now Hydro still has to make its case to the Public Utilities Board before that can happen. But I talked to Dennis Brown today, and he told me their application doesn't add up. Graf Falls is not within the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Board, so I don't understand how parts of that application, which pertain to Musgraf Falls, could be brought before the board. And the other part is the, the press release don't, does not state exactly what the money is to be used for or what it was spent on. Um, we haven't received the application here. They announced uh, uh, through a press release on Friday that this was coming, but uh, the application itself hasn't been distributed to the parties yet. We haven't seen the application, so we don't know the particulars. A lot of people are looking at this and saying they've already just received about a 10% increase and now looking for another one. Do you, will, will you argue that um, rates should not go up that much? Uh, electricity has to be affordable. The more rates go up, the more people will move to other forms of, of heating. Remember, the utilities make their money off electric heating. If electric heating, uh, if the cost of electric heating continues to rise, people will move to oil, they'll move to wood, they'll move to other forms, uh, they'll move to heat pumps. So uh, I don't think it's in uh, the utilities' best interest to keep increasing prices. It's the wrong signal to be sending and furthermore we do have Muskrat Falls coming 
uh, up at some point in the future. It's, uh, we don't know what that will cost. I noticed the application also meant purchasing power from Nova Scotia, which I found bizarre. Why would they talk about purchasing power from Nova Scotia now? It's my understanding where we're selling power to Nova Scotia. What's happening? Are they selling it back to us now? What about uh, the argument that Hydro has made that they need this increase because they've done upgrades after the outage in Dark and now people have asked for a more reliable system and they are just spending the money in order to give people what they're looking for? Well, the evidence was Dark and L was entirely their problem. They had allowed the system to decline. They weren't keeping up with uh, safety standards and that's why we had Darkenell because they took their entire focus off the island, put their focus on Muskrat Falls and forgot about us and got caught. Now they're coming to look for more money from the ratepayers of the island and, uh, and, and some from the, the ratepayers of Labrador too uh, to pay for uh, what was their negligence to begin with. Well, there are two more dead North Atlantic right whales and they've washed ashore in western Newfoundland. You're looking at footage from earlier this month of the dead whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The Federal Fisheries Department says the discoveries bring the total number of confirmed North Atlantic right whale deaths to at least nine. Scientists are working to learn more about the cause of the death. There are only about 500 right whales left in the world. While scientists look to find out the cause of the whales in this, this situation, one animal expert says some of them did not die of natural causes. The person with the World Wildlife Fund um, says some of the whales show signs of a ship strike and one, the cause of death was fishing gear entanglement. And the World Wildlife Fund says it's imperative we try and understand how the whales are using the Gulf. This uh, population cannot withstand uh, the deaths at the rate that it's currently going. Uh, it will reach a tipping point where recovery for this species is no longer feasible. So uh, we really need to uh, act today because tomorrow just may be too late. Let's look at Toronto now, where parts of the busy 401 highway just north of the city were closed early this morning following a fatal collision and a massive fire. One person is confirmed dead after two trucks collided. A tractor trailer was engulfed in flames. One of the trucks was carrying a load of paint, which was spread across the eastbound lanes. The highway is one of the busiest in North America. Thousands of cars were backed up for hours due to lane closures. Well, for years, experts have warned that prescription painkillers are extremely addictive. It's a warning that has proved true as Canada has been grappling with what some people describe as an opioid crisis. But as Carissa Duncan reports, new numbers show governments in three Atlantic provinces are covering the costs of more of these addictive drugs each year, and it's costing tens of millions of dollars. Provincial health plans in three Atlantic provinces have covered the cost of more than two million prescriptions for addictive painkillers, drugs like morphine and Dilaudid, that's the equivalent of one prescription for each person in Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick. The total bill cost nearly $52 million. That's a 26% increase between 2010 and 2015. The data comes from the Canadian Institute for Health Information and it shows that publicly funded health plans are covering more and more opioids each year, despite warnings about how addictive these drugs are. It doesn't show how many pills were ordered in each prescription, and it doesn't capture people who paid for prescriptions out of pocket or through private health insurance. We spoke with the New Brunswick Medical Society. That organization is concerned about the number of opioid prescriptions doctors are writing. CEO Anthony Knight says the society has stepped up education on opioid prescribing, but the problem lies with how doctors are treating chronic pain. Well, really the root cause of, of Opioid prescribing uh, largely is related to pain management, and we know that in in healthcare and in our system in New Brunswick, uh, there could be more resources uh, assigned to how pain is managed and supported for patients, and what sort of tools and and resources could be made available to physicians, healthcare providers, and patients in and around the healthcare system so that we, we don't find this trend continuing of growing uh, prescriber habits around opioid prescribing. 
This comes as Atlantic provinces are starting to take steps toward addressing the issue of opioid misuse. That includes better monitoring of opioid overdoses. Carissa Donkin, CBC News, St. John. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. You know, for anyone who decided that July was a good month to come to visit Newfoundland and Labrador, they really lucked out this year. Oh yeah, or if you decided that's when you wanted to take your vacation time. Absolutely, and uh, I've seen lots of visitors who've been out checking out whales. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of icebergs around yeah. the go. Uh, and speaking of icebergs, there's actually an interesting project. Here, we want to show you some interesting footage. Take a look. Now this is RPM Aerial Services and uh, they've been tasked with uh, quite an interesting project. They're putting GPS tracking devices on icebergs and they're using drones to do it. Yeah, so what you're seeing there is uh, footage from the drones. They're busy dropping these uh, trackers onto the icebergs and then that way they'll be able to keep an eye on where the icebergs are going. And I guess it's a safe way to do it because we've all seen the footage of icebergs rolling over so yeah. you don't want to get too close. Absolutely, very, very cool. All right, well, let's see how things are shaping up for tomorrow. It's going to be another beautiful day here in the east. We have a mix of sun and cloud and 20 degrees in St. John's. Some showers, though, moving in tomorrow afternoon for central parts of the island and a risk of thunder showers in places like Bay Vert and uh, Grand Falls, Windsor and Humber Valley. So keep an eye out for that and about five millimeters of rain expected tomorrow and also a drizzly day in the morning for much of Labrador, particularly along the coast and cooler. McCovic looking at a high of 15 degrees. Things should clear off by the afternoon though, so you should be seeing some nice weather uh, later in the day. So looking ahead to uh, Tuesday evening, you can see lots of showers uh, here on the island and patchy showers up there in in Labrador. So if you're heading out Tuesday night, this is what you want to see. So we have um, the uh, showers here and uh, also on the Avalon Peninsula tomorrow evening. So it should clear off overnight, but there's still a chance of getting uh, a few small showers uh, throughout the morning and also uh, in Labrador on uh, Wednesday morning, some showers there in Lab West. So uh, Things are looking pretty good though for Regatta Day. It should be fairly cool, about 18 degrees as the high. This is a very close look at uh, the Avalon Peninsula. You can see the showers that will be moving in on Tuesday evening and they should move off overnight. Lots of cloud cover and uh, it, it will be about 13 degrees to start off 4 a.m. on a Wednesday. So things will heat up during the day, but we have some cool wind coming down from the north. So it's not going to be a super hot day and we should see some cloud cover hopefully some sun as well. So overall, not a bad day. It actually sounds like it's going to be quite a comfortable day if you're planning to head uh, lakeside on Wednesday. So 18 degrees, as I mentioned, as the high on Wednesday with a mix of sun and cloud and sun and cloud right across the island on Wednesday. Temperatures a little bit cooler with those onshore winds. Uh, St. Anthony looking at uh, 12 degrees as the high there. Nice in Cornerbrook, 22 as the high uh, there. And uh, you can see some more showers in Lab West. Lots and lots of showers up there lately and cooler temperatures along the coast, though, quite nice. 17 degrees as the high in Nain on Wednesday. So looking ahead to Wednesday night into Thursday, more showers in Labrador and some cloud cover on the island. But overall, we're looking at some pretty nice weather on the island. But as you can see, more of those showers uh, across Labrador. So Happy Valley Goose Bay will see uh, some showers on Thursday. Thursday. Lab City is looking gorgeous, 20 degrees as the high there. And the island is just fantastic. A little bit cooler in the east, 17 degrees as the high, but temperatures in the mid 20s in Central and in Cornerbrook on Thursday. So 
overall looking like a pretty nice week. You can see all of the sun and cloud here uh, for St. John's and the East. Nice temperatures as we head into the weekend, so hopefully that will stick around. A few showers on Friday for central and western parts of the island, but temperatures really, really nice. Lots of showers continuing for parts of Labrador, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and eastern Labrador should see some showers on the weekend, but at least it's still warm, 21, 22 degrees, and some showers as well for Western Labrador. Well, it's time now to introduce you to our Young Athlete of the Day and introduce you to a hockey player from Mount Pearl. Ashton Toop is eight years old and plays center with the Mount Pearl Minor Hockey Association in the Novice Division. Ashton's favorite NHL team is the Philadelphia Flyers. Congratulations, Ashton. You are our Young Athlete of the Day. Now I feel like I gotta devote everything to music because that was us. Remem and that was all I've got left of her. Remembering her sister through song, we'll meet 15-year-old Erica Dunn, whose younger sister and singing partner was killed in an ATV accident just two weeks ago. Welcome back to Here and Now. Erica Dunn of Bonavista lost her 13-year-old sister Heidi in an ATV accident two weeks ago. The two girls were inseparable, largely because of their mutual passion for music. The Dunn sisters were a well-known singing duo on the Bonavista Peninsula. Heidi, who's there on the right, was killed on July 15th when the ATV she was in flipped. Now, 15-year-old Erica is trying to adjust to life without her sister and finding comfort in the music they shared. Just days after Heidi's death, Erica pushed through her grief and performed in a singing competition on the Bonavista Peninsula, a competition she had planned to enter with Heidi. Erica won that competition, and now she's remembering her sister through song. I sat down with Erica to talk about her special relationship with her sister. 
Well, Erica, thank you so much for coming in here today. How are you doing? Good. How's your family doing? All right, we're getting by. Yeah. Let's talk about your sister. Can you tell us a bit about what Heidi was like? She was, uh, she was something else, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, she's insanely talented, it's ridiculous. She was really quirky. She always had that weird way about her, but she made everyone stay and everyone just loved to be around her and everyone's heartbroken, honestly. Yeah. And you guys, you know, your sister's only two years apart. Uh, I would imagine you were very close. Extremely. This is the longest time I've ever gone without her. Really? Like the most time we spent apart was maybe a weekend if one of us went to a friend's or something. Tell us about your relationship with her. Um, we argued like siblings do, but that's normal. But we were always together. Every show we did was together. There was never a time, like, everything we did was together. Um, I'm still never gonna be able to find anyone that can get along with me musically wise, like she did. And it's just, it's gonna be really hard because we were writing songs and working on an album and everything, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish it without her. Can you take us back? Where did this mutual love of music come from? Um, well, I guess when I started playing piano, she was really young then, so I guess she just watched me learn more as a musician, and she wanted to try it herself, I guess, and then we said, oh, let's try this together, and we did, and we haven't stopped well, until now. And you have a song I do. that you're going to perform for us. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about this song? Um, well, I, I sang this song last year at Idol. It was my first song, and it's called She Used to Be Mine, and you can look at it in a couple of different ways. For me, it's about Heidi. Like, man, she was such a beautiful person. And I love the song so much, it's kind of sad, so <laughs> forgive me if I tear up a little. It's not simple to say most days I don't recognize me These shoes and this apron this place and its patrons have taken more than I gave them. It's not easy to know I'm not anything like I used to be, although it's true. I was never attention sweet center, but I still remember that girl. She's in she tries she is good what do you want people to remember about your sister definitely her music but definitely her uh, quirky attitude and personality she had a lot of attitude <laughs> what would you say to her now I keep on singing she is messy but she's kind i know she wanted a career in that so bad and we were gonna try we were supposed to move to ireland and go to college together for music and Mom said, you can't do that, because if you use weights and uh, leaves together, I'm not going to have no one left. She is gone, but she used to be mine. But uh, I know i got to keep doing music, because she'd want me to, and that was our thing, and I can't stop. Because even if I did, like, she'd be disappointed in me. Just slips in through the back door and carves out a person. So what is music going to mean for you now in the future? so much more than it ever did. Like before it was, like it meant a lot to me, but now like it's gotta be my life. Cause she was, she was my life. And now like, I feel like this is what I've got left for her. It's this music. And I'm gonna do everything I can to try and uh, commemorate her like that. And just make sure everyone knows like how much she meant to me and what music meant to us as a group. Cause we, that's what we were. We were a duo. Like you didn't get one without the other. My entire life has been dedicated to this, and hers was too. Like her, all of her 13 years was music. And just because one half of our duo is gone, doesn't mean all the music together got to stop. So I'm gonna keep playing for her and know that she's there with me. Now I feel like I gotta devote 
everything to music because that was us. And now it's all I've got left of her. So I feel like it's something I gotta do for both of us, even for mom. I'm gonna keep playing for her and play the songs we did, even though it's not gonna be the same or half as good. She was my harmony. So uh, I'm just gonna keep playing. She's gone, but she used to be mine. Wow. Mm. Such strength for 15 years old to be able to go through all that, still perform, mm -hmm. and still want to keep going on. I Yep, just pushing through it, just wanting to talk about her sister and make sure that people remember her and pay tribute to her. And such a well-spoken uh, young woman, too. So. Amazing. Very nice, yeah. Well, thanks for uh, bringing us that story, oh, Carolyn. Thanks. Well, local actor Mark O'Brien made it to the big leagues this weekend. He threw out the ceremonial opening pitch at an LA Dodgers game against the San Francisco Giants. O'Brien was there to promote his new Amazon video series, The Last Tycoon, based on the unfinished novel by F. Scott Fitzgerald. We'll be back. Welcome back to Here and Now. A group of adventure seekers are attempting to achieve a new Guinness World Record, taking new, their dining to new heights. 102 ab sailors are barbecuing food while hanging from a rope on an abandoned bridge. The table and the grill hangs 65 feet above the ground. They hope to be the largest group of people sitting at a dining table while suspended in the sky. It's a very specific record they're breaking here. But it looks like fun, and that's certainly dining al fresco. <laughs> Why? Why? All right, so this is a, a recap of uh, the next Three days, we're looking at some really nice temperatures in the east. 20 degrees tomorrow as the high with uh, some sun and cloud. Wednesday looking pretty nice. 18 degrees there for regatta day. The rest of the island, a uh, chance of thunder showers in central Newfoundland tomorrow. A high of 16 degrees. And uh, in the west, 
some cloudy skies and, and some rain tomorrow with a high of uh, 18 degrees. But things will start to warm up later in the week. And in Labrador, we're looking at a uh, chance of showers in uh, the west and in the east tomorrow with a high of around 17 or 18 degrees. So this is a uh, just a beautiful wow. picture. Don't you just want to be sitting in that chair? I so want to be sitting in that oh. chair with a nice cool drink watching that sunset. That's beautiful. amazing. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Wendy uh, Graham, for sending this in. I believe Emily is the one who actually took the picture. So, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. And you have something to share, Peter. Yes, have a look here. <laughs> On Friday's show, I told you guys I was going to go cod fishing. Right. And Ryan said, make sure you go Saturday. And he was right because the weather on Saturday was great. And I uh, got to go out. I went out with Lee Pitts, producer here at CBC. Right. And uh, his family took me out. So uh, thanks to Everett and all the other uncles who, uh, who, let's be honest, they did the hard work. Well, that's a big cod that you caught. Absolutely. And I'm going to take credit for that giant <laughs> cod. Whether or not that may have actually come up on my rod or it was just in the boat where I was fishing. You were just wanted to hold it, right? But you didn't actually. And I will eat it. And eat it, yes. Well, thanks so much for watching. Have a great night. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Good night.